It is great to be back. I always love coming here. I, I love this room. I love the, the venue, and uh, I love Decatur. It's a nice little town. And I, I was walking around here this afternoon and uh, had a couple of good meals. Uh, thank you, Bill. Uh, Bill's been a good friend to me and a supporter of my work, and, and I, he's obviously doing great work here in Decatur. Um, tonight, what I thought I'd do is, is, is read a little bit from Serena, talk a little bit about it, maybe leave a few minutes for, for a few questions if you have them. I'd be glad to answer those. Uh, this novel came to me uh, almost three years ago, exactly, a little more than three years ago. I was driving on one of the mountain roads near where I teach, and I had an image of a a woman on a huge white horse, and sun. It was it was dawn. The sun was coming up behind her. I. She had blonde hair, and the sun, as it hit her hair, shimmered, and it was almost as if she were wearing a crown. And uh, I, for for whatever reason, perhaps because I, I, I'm also a poet, uh, every novel I've written has, has begun with an image. And, and so this was the image that started Serena. And as I, as I came to, to, to know Serena and the story uh, better, I realized that she was from Colorado, had grown up in a timber camp herself. Uh, her father had owned, learned a lot about timber and hunting and riding. Uh, at a time, you know, this is uh, the novel set 1929, 1931, when this would have been unusual for a woman. She goes to Boston, meets a man named Pemberton who owns a, a, a timber uh, camp in, in the North Carolina mountains. They marry very quickly. Uh, she feels like they're fated to be together. And uh, they come south. And, and, and then, as, as they've been married, as I say, probably about well, right at a week. And as they're getting off the train, they are met by uh, Pemberton who has been in this camp for a couple of years, has uh, impregnated one of the uh, kitchen workers. So they're met at the, uh, at the, the railroad station in, in Waynesville, North Carolina, by uh, this pregnant girl and her very angry husband. And that's where the novel begins. There's a knife fight, and uh, the uh, uh, kitchen worker's father is killed by Pemberton. And this is really the first moment we get to see Serena. And I remember writing this scene because I didn't know what she was going to do. You know, how do, how do you deal with this, you know? And, uh, uh, you know, you, you, you meet your husband's uh, former concubine, lover, whatever, and uh, she's seven months pregnant. And uh, what happens is Serena picks up the knife that the dead man has dropped, takes it over to this young girl who's only 16 years old, gives it to her and says, this is all you'll get from me and my husband. And that's, you know, that's what I knew. I had a woman that, you know, this, it's fitting I'm reading this the night before Halloween because uh, she scared me writing about her. And, uh, and she, she, she becomes uh, very quickly uh, a, 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 a character that inspires consternation and awe from the workers. She's essentially the only woman in the camp except for a couple of kitchen workers. She's surrounded by 100 very rough men, timber men, timber cutters. But she quickly impresses them. She wins a, a, a contest uh, judging board feet with one of them, uh, rides, uh, uh, does not ride side saddle, rides like a man, uh, quickly shows she knows more about the business than her husband. Her husband essentially becomes a bookkeeper while she goes out with the crews. And she becomes more and more... Uh, revered by the men and also feared a bit and and I, I wanted her that way I wanted her to be a larger than life character and as I was working on the book I, I had to I wanted one more thing that would really ratchet it up that would impress these men who would not be very easily impressed by anything and um, as, as writers are prone to do I, I came up with what at first seemed like a a, a, a rather outrageous idea. I knew one thing from doing research and talking to some old loggers that there was always a problem with rattlesnakes in these mountains when they were, were cutting timber. So I thought, well, I'll have her kill the rattlesnakes. That, that would impress these men because that would be one of the few things they would fear. And um, 
I thought about that, and I thought, well, I mean, she can shoot them, but uh, that's not that impressive. I mean, anybody can do that. So I thought about it some more, and I said, well, what if I have her hunt, hunt them with a, at first I said hawk, and I said, no, nah, that's not impressive, with an eagle, you know, train an eagle to hunt them with rattlesnakes. And, and I thought, hey, that's a good idea. <laughs> but would anybody believe that? Can I make that even remotely feasible? And um, so I actually did a lot of research, I actually talked to a number of people, finally found one of 12 people in the United States who hunts with an eagle, a guy out in Wyoming named Scott Simpson. And uh, I, I told him what I was thinking about, and uh, I said, is there any way I could make this believable? And he said, yeah, you could. You, and he actually, in the next few months, uh, Scott helped me uh, understand how I would do that, how I would actually train uh, an eagle uh, to hunt a rattlesnake and, and kill it. And, 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 and uh, you know, it, I love doing that kind of research. And I love always, as I, as I tell my students, it, when you're doing research, find the fanatics. You know, find, find the, 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 the crazy people that care about only one thing in the world. Mm -hmm. and, and that's all Scott certainly cared about. So um, as I was working on this, uh, one night I was talking to him. And, well, actually, two very interesting thing ha things happened. One, I thought my cell phone was going out because I kept hearing this chirping. And uh, I said, I think my, my phone's dying. He said, no, that's my eagle. And I, I, that was when I realized that the eagle actually lived with him. And then the other thing that same night he said was, you know, if you really want this eagle to be impressive, it ought to be a bear goot. And, of course, I didn't know what a bear goot was. And he said, well, that's a Mongolian eagle. This is the most revered eagle in the world, hunting eagle. And, uh, and, he, and he told me this, you know, amazing, these amazing anecdotes about this eagle, uh, you know, that they actually, uh, uh, there have been reported instances of them uh, attacking snow leopards. Uh, they've been used on occasion in, in Asia to hunt wolves, which, you know, that's a badass bird. And that's exactly what Serena needed. And so I had her actually uh, hunt with this eagle and, and you know, pretty much uh, make, make a pretty big impression on these uh, people that were uh, these loggers. And this is a scene, I'm just going to read a page where uh, the eagle actually arrives because I also had a problem um, with the fact that how do I get an eagle from Mongolia <laughs> to uh, Waynesville, North Carolina, you know, essentially into the back of beyond, as that area has been called. And, uh, and this is uh, how that happened. Uh, I felt like she probably, uh, probably they would need somebody to come with the eagle from Mongolia. And this is uh, about that little scene. The eagle arrived in December. Serena notified the depot master it would be coming and must be brought immediately to camp. And so it was... 10-foot wooden slat crate and its inhabitant placed on a flat car with two youths in attendance. The train making its slow ascent from Waynesville as if bringing a visiting dignitary. With the eagle came two small leather bags. One was a thick gauntlet of goat skin to cover the forearm from wrist to elbow, and the other the leather hood and jesses and swivels and the leash. That in a single piece of rag paper that may have been instructions or a bill or even a warning, but written in a language that the depot master had never seen before, but suspected was Comanche. The conductor of the train that brought the bird to Wayne's will disagree, telling of the strange man who'd accompanied the bird from Charleston to Asheville. Hair black as a crow's feather and wearing a dress so bright blue it hurt your eyeballs to look at it long, the conductor told the men at the depot and a pointy fur hat, plus a sword on his belt, nigh tall as he was, that give a fellow pause about making sport of the dress he wore. No siree, the conductor declared. That wasn't one of our Indians. Well, they bring the eagle into camp. Serena will actually train the bird, and, uh, and then we'll use it uh, to hunt those rattlesnakes. And as I was working on this book, I've always loved Elizabethan drama. Uh, certainly Shakespeare, but just as much uh, I've been fascinated with Marlowe's work. Uh, and as I, as I got into this book, I wanted it to kind of have a feel of, 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 of a, a tragedy, certainly, but also a feel of, of, of maybe a little bit of Greek tragedy and, and Elizabethan drama. And um, I felt one thing that would be very helpful in this regard would be um, a chorus. And 
I made my course a little different from probably what uh, Sophocles had in mind because my course was a bunch of good old boys, uh, Western North Carolina loggers. Um, and I had a lot of fun with this. I felt like it was needed because it is a dark book in some ways. Uh, you know, it's funny. When I, I, was t I was talking to my agent the other day, and I said, I don't think my books are all that dark. And she said, well, to you. Um, but I, I thought it would be kind of interesting to have this, the, this course kind of, you know, all through the book. And also a way of kind of uh, proving that not everything I write is dark and dreary. Uh, and in the course, I, I had... Yeah, you know, I had four people, four men, uh, and and one was a, a man named Snipes who perceives himself as a philosopher. Uh, he has a pair of glasses that do not have lenses, but he puts them on whenever he wants to make some kind of a great pronouncement. You know, uh, um, a man named uh, McIntyre who is a preacher, lay preacher. He has a congregation of three, uh, and he's uh, just upset horrified at Serena, you know, uh, and, and her appearance, wearing pants, you know, that, that upsets him. Um, uh, a more credulous man named Snipes, I mean not Snipes, but Stewart, and uh, a cynical guy named Ross. So they kind of are, are commenting all through the book, and I wanted to read just a couple of brief sections with them. Uh, this is the first time that they actually see Serena in camp, uh, or at least the first time McIntyre does. And... Uh, when, he, when, when McIntyre saw Serena standing on the office porch in pants, he choked on the peppermint he sucked to ease his stomach. There she is, McIntyre sputtered, the whore of Babylon in the very flesh. Dunbar, the youngest member of the crew at 19, looked toward the porch incomprehensibly. He turned to McIntyre, who was dressed in the black preacher's hat and frayed black dress coat he wore, even on the hottest days, as a sign of his true calling. Where? Dunbar asked. Right on that porch, standing there brazen as Jezebel, Stewart, along with McIntyre's wife and sister, who, along with McIntyre's wife and sister, made up the whole of the lay preacher's congregation, turned to his minister and spoke. Why are you a mind to say such a thing as that, preacher? Them pants, McIntyre proclaimed. It's in the Revelations. It says the whore of Babylon will come forth in the last days wearing pants. Ross, a dour man, not kindly disposed to McIntyre's rants, stared at the lay preachers he might a chimpanzee that had wandered into camp and begun chattering. I read Revelations many a time, McIntyre, Ross said. Somehow missed that verse. It ain't in the King James, McIntyre said. It's in the original Greek. <laughs> read Greek, do you, Ross said. That's ever amazing for a man who can't even read English. Well, no, McIntyre said slowly, I don't read Greek, but I've heard from them what does. Them what does, Ross said and shook his head. Well, they have another philosophical discussion a little bit later uh, on a very cold night and uh, or cold day. They're out working and... Uh, this is what they have to say. Listen to that wind howl, Dunbar said. With the sound of it, you'd think it could lift this whole mountain. Barely October and snow already on the ground, Ross said. A hard winter's coming. My daddy said the woolly worms is wearing a thicker coat all summer, and we're sure enough seeing the truth of it, Stewart said. Daddy allowed that wasn't the only sign. He said the hornets was building their nest close to the ground. Them's pagan believing, Stewart. McIntyre said to his congregant, and you best stay clear of them. There's some science in it, Snipes said. Those woolly worms was growing thicker hair to, just to stand for a hard winter. There ain't no pagan in that. Woolly worms just using the knowledge God give them. The hornet's the same. The only signs you need to follow is in the Bible, McIntyre said. What about that sign that says no smoking on the dynamite shed, Ross noted. You're saying we don't need to follow that one. You can make sport of it, McIntyre said to Ross, but this unnatural weather is a certain sign of the last days. The sun will be darkened and the moon shall not give up its light. McIntyre looked at the gray slate sky as if he were some Gnostic, if it, as if it were some Gnostic text only he was capable of deciphering. 
He tipped his black preacher's hat heavenward, seemingly satisfied at what he'd seen. There'll be famines and pestilences coming after that, McIntyre proclaimed. There'll be nary a plant sprout out of the ground but thorns, and you'll have grasshoppers big as rabbits eating everything else, even the wood on your house. Snakes and scorpions and all such terrible things falling from the sky. And you think this is going to happen any day now, Ross asked. Yes, I do, McIntyre replied, and I'm certain of it as old Noah himself was when he built that boat. And I reckon we better start bringing umbrellas with us to work, Ross said. Ain't no weed to it, McIntyre replied. I'll be raptured up the day before it starts. It'll be you and the other infidels has to deal with it. Well, Serena trains the bird, actually trains it the way that's traditionally done in Mongolia. She'll actually go in seclusion with the bird. She will not sleep. She will not eat for 48 hours until the bird breaks and takes food from her hand. Uh, and uh, it's an act of will. And so she will uh, come, the, come the spring and, and summer, uh, she, she trains the bird early summer. And finally, she gets to uh, take it out and hunt with it. And this is what happens. It was mid-July when Serena freed the eagle from the block perch and rode west to Fork Ridge where Galloway and his crew worked on the near slope. Serena loosed the leather laces and removed the eagle's hood, then freed the leash from the bracelets. She raised her right arm. As if performing some violent salute, Serena thrust her forearm and the eagle upward. The bird ascended and began a dihedral circle over the 20 acres of stumps behind Galloway's crew. On the third circle, the eagle stopped. For a moment, the bird hung poised in the sky seemingly outside the world's slow turning. Then it appeared not so much to fall, but to slice open the air. Its body veed like an axe head as it propelled downward. Once on the ground among the stumps and slash, the eagle opened its wings like a flourish cape. The bird wobbled forward, paused, moved forward again, the yellow talons sparring with some creature hidden in the detritus. In another minute, the eagle's head dipped, then rose with a hank of stringy pink flesh in its beak. Serena opened the saddle bag and removed a metal whistle and a lariat. Fastened to one end of the hemp was a piece of bloody beef. She blew the whistle and the bird's neck whirled in her direction as Serena swung the lure overhead. They lured God, a worker said. For as the eagle rose, in its talons was a three-foot-long rattlesnake. The bird flew toward the ridge crest, then arced back, drifting down towards Serena and Galloway's crew. Except for Galloway, the men scattered as if dynamite had been lit, stumbling and tripping over stumps and slash as they fled. The eagle settled on the ground with an elegant awkwardness, the serpent still writhing, but its movements only a memory of when it had been alive. Serena dismounted and offered the goblet of meat. The bird released the snake and pounced on the beef. When it finished eating, Serena placed the hood back over the eagle's head. Can I have the skin and rattles, Galloway asked. Yes, Serena said, but the meat belongs to the bird. A month's in, the eagle had killed seven rattlesnakes, including a huge satin bag that panicked Snipe's crew when it slipped from the bird's grasp mid-flight and fell earthward. The men hadn't seen the eagle overhead and the serpent fell among them like some last remnant of Satan's rebellion cast from heaven. The snake landed closest to McIntyre and had just enough life left to slither a few inches and rest its head on the lay preacher's boot toe, causing McIntyre to fall backward and dead faint. Well, that is so traumatic for preacher McIntyre that he actually quit speaking for weeks. He goes to bed, he can't work, uh, and uh, it, you know nobody knows what's going on with him, but he's obviously just uh, completely out of it. And this is a little report. Uh, this is the last piece of the course I'll read uh, where they're, they're finding out the latest on McIntyre. You know, several weeks have passed by now. Is McIntyre doing any better, Dunbar asked. 
Not a lick, Stewart said. His missus took him back over to the nervous hospital, and for a while they was favoring electrocuting him. Electrocuting him, Dunbar exclaimed. Stewart nodded. That's what them doctors said, claimed it for a new thing. They've been talking up big in Boston and New York. They'd get some cables, same as you'd spark a car battery off with and pinch them on his ears and run electricity all up and down through him. Lord have mercy, Dunbar said. They figure McIntyre for a man or a light bulb. His missus don't like the idea of one bit neither. I'm with her, Stewart said. How could you argue such a thing could do anybody good? There's a scientific principle involved in it, Snipes said, speaking for the first time. Your body needs a certain amount of electricity to keep going, same as a radio or a telephone or even the universe itself. A man like McIntyre, it's like he's got a low battery and needs spark back up. Electricity, like the dog, is one of man's best friends. Stewart pondered Snipes' words a few moments. And how come they use it down there in Raleigh to kill them murderers and such? Snipes looked at Stewart and shook his head, much in the manner of a teacher who knows his fate is to always have a steward in his class. Electricity is like most everything else in nature, Stewart. There's two kinds of humans, you're good and bad. Just like you got two kinds of weather, you're good and bad, right? What about days it rains and that's good for a man's bean crop, but bad because that fellow was wanting to go fishing, we're all interjected. That ain't relevant to this here particular discussion, Snipes retorted, turning back to Stewart. So you understand what I'm getting at, there being the good and the bad and all manner of things. Stewart nodded. Well, Snipes said, that's your scientific principle in action. Anyway, what they'd use on McIntyre is the good kind of electricity because it just goes in you and gets everything back to flowing good. What they use on them criminals fries your brains and innards up. Now, that's the bad kind. Well, Preacher McIntyre will have one true vision toward the end of the book. He will. He will. But it's going to be a while. Well, I wanted to finish the reading part. Uh, I kind of left uh, Rachel Harmon. She's the young young girl who's pregnant with Mac and, uh, the Pemberton child uh, at the, in, a, in a really precarious situation. She's 16 years old, seven months pregnant. She's just seen her father killed by the man who impregnated her. Uh, she's just been told uh, that she will have absolutely no support from the man who fathered this child or his wife. Uh, she has no brothers and sisters. Her mother left at five. And it, it was interesting as I was doing the drafts of this book because Rachel was a pretty minor character in the book uh, at, at the beginning. I mean, Serena dominates the book. And, uh, but, and I think as, as, I, as I got deeper into the book, I realized that, that Rachel was a counter, not only uh, you know, a foil as a character, but also I think philosophically. I mean, for me, uh, Serena's an, uh, a Nietzschean. Uh, she's utterly ruthless. Uh, she breaks what Hawthorne calls the magnetic chain of humanity. Uh, and Rachel, I think, is a counter to that, or I know she is. Uh, and as I got to know her better as a character, I, I came to really uh, admire her because she has so little going for her. I don't know if that sounds strange to you that a writer feels this way. Uh, but uh, these characters, you know, always become real uh, to me. And uh, I hope things turned out well for her. And uh, she really grows stronger through the novel. Uh, and she actually becomes the one person, the, uh, the unlikeliest person in some ways, who can actually uh, stand up to Serena and, and really fight her. Uh, and uh, I won't give away too much, but it becomes very interesting. But it begins, uh, you know, for her, as I say, in just the, the worst situation. And in and, and this little scene I'm going to finish with, uh, she has finally said, it's, it's, it's a few months after uh, the, the killing of her father, she's delivered the child, uh, this uh, child that she has no one to help her with, except for an old widow woman who, who is, does what she can. Um, but she's, she's conflicted about even loving this child. 
because uh, she's constantly reminded. Uh, she has blue eyes. The child's eyes are brown. She's reminded of the man who killed her father, the man who's the father of this child, you know, at the same time. And she's thinking about the price of love in this scene and uh, trying to remember something about her father, who was a hard man, uh, a bitter man, particularly after, as, as, as this will make clear. She stood by the tombstone, dirt, the stonemason had displaced, darkening the grave. Her father had been a hard man to live with, awkward in his affection, never saying much. His temper like a kitchen match waiting to be struck, especially if he'd been drinking. Rachel heard an older woman at the funeral claim her father had been a different man before her mother left, less prone to anger and bitterness, never bad to drink. Rachel couldn't remember that man. Yet he'd raised a child by himself, a girl child. And Rachel figured he'd done it as well as any man could have alone. She'd never gone wanting for food and clothing. There were plenty of things he hadn't taught her, maybe couldn't teach her. But she'd learned about crops and plants and animals, how to mend a fence and chink a cabin. He'd had her do these things herself while he watched, making sure she knew how Rachel now realized when she, he'd not be around to do it for her. What was that if not a kind of love? She touched the tombstone and felt its sturdiness and solidity. It made her think of the cradle her father had built two weeks before he died. He brought it in and set it by her bed, not speaking a single word, acknowledging he'd made it for the child. But she could see the care in the making of it, how he'd built it out of hickory, the hardest and most lasting wood there was. Made not just to last, but to look pretty, for he'd sanded the cradle and then varnished it with linseed oil. Rachel removed her hand from a stone she knew would outlast her lifetime. And that meant it would outlast her grief. I've gotten him buried in godly ground and I've burned the clothes he died in, Rachel told herself. I signed the death certificate and now his gravestone's up. I've done all I can do. She told herself this, Rachel felt the grief inside grow so wide and deep it felt like a dark, fathomless pool she'd never emerged from. Because there was nothing left to do now, nothing except endure it. Think of something happy, she told herself. Something he did for you. A small thing. For a few moments, nothing came. Then something did. Something that had happened about this time of year. After supper, her father had gone to the barn while she went to the garden. In the waning light, she gathered ripe pole beans whose dark pods nestled up to the rows of sweet corn she'd planted as trellis. Her father called from the barn mouth and she'd set the wash pan between two rows, thinking he needed her to carry the milk pail to the spring house. Pretty, isn't it, he'd said as she entered the barn. Her father pointed to a large silver green moth. For a few minutes, the chores were put off as the two of them just stood there. The barn stripes of light grew dimmer, and the moth seemed to brighten, as if the slow open and close of its wings gathered up the evening's last light. Then the creature rose. As the moth fluttered out into the night, her father had lifted his large, strong hand and settled it on Rachel's shoulder a moment not turning to her as he did so. A moth, a twilight, the touch of a hand. Something, Rachel thought. As she rode back down the trail, she remembered the days after the funeral, how the house's silence was a palpable thing and she couldn't endure a day without visiting Widow Jenkins for something borrowed or returned. Then one morning, she'd begun to feel her sorrow easy, like something jagged that had cut into her so long it had finally dulled its edges, worn itself down. The same day, Rachel couldn't remember which side her father had parted his hair on. 
she'd realize again what she'd learned at five when her mother left. That what made losing someone you loved bearable was not remembering, but forgetting. Forgetting small things first. The smell of the soap her mother had bathed with. The color of the dress she'd worn to church. And after a while, the sound of her mother's voice. The color of her hair. It amazed Rachel how much you could forget. And everything you forgot made that person less alive inside you until you could finally endure it. After more time passed, you could let yourself remember, even want to remember. But even then, what you felt those first days could return and remind you the grief was still there, like old barbed wire embedded in a tree's heartwood. And now this brown-eyed child. Don't love it, Rachel told herself. Don't love anything that can be taken away. But she will. <laughs> Thank you. If you have a couple of questions, I'll be glad to at least try to answer them. Yes, ma'am. It, I don't know. Uh, I, I, she's a, you know, she's a character that you know, I would like to. I, I, I'm kind of curious about what will happen to her. I don't want to give away too much, but yeah, she's a she's a character that I'm very fond of. Maybe, maybe you're not the first person to ask that. <laughs> Well, uh, you know, I, I think it just really depends on, I, I think it's really kind of dependent on where I am with my life. I think when I was younger, uh, poetry uh, just seemed more important to me. I mean, it's still important, but, but as I've, I've got, I, I don't think I was able to write a novel until I really got in my 40s. And I think that's kind of where I am now. But uh, they, they, they each have uh, certain pleasures. Uh, I think that, but, but and, and, and they all have certain feelings. Uh, I think there's a feeling with a novel that I don't get from anything else because there's a sense that I've created a world, maybe a small world, but a, a world in which people live. Um, but with poetry, uh, I love that sense of just suddenly language, you know, using it at its most intense. Uh, you know, that so much can be conveyed with so few words. And I love short stories because I think they're the hardest of all to do. They're the most challenging because I think you have to bring so much of what you bring to poetry, but also a lot of what you bring to a novel and somehow those fuse together in a good story. Uh, you know, a story like Flannery O'Connor, what she can do, that kind of thing. But um, I don't know. I think it just depends on, uh, you know, it's, not, it's, it's never been a deliberate decision. You know, it's just been something that's happened. I mean, uh, you know, someday, you know, so for a while there, I can only write poems. And it's almost like a shift to a different frequency. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to be vague and evasive on that. I am. The next thing's going to be a book of short stories. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, HarperCollins is going to do it. And we just decided on that about two weeks ago. But, that's yeah, that's the next thing. And, uh, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Well, I hope so. I hope so. And I, I, you know, I think one one advantage about writing about the natural world is, uh, I think you can make a pretty good argument. It's the most uh, universal of languages, if you think about it. I mean, in the sense that I think it transfers very easily from different cultures. Maybe not quite as easy as a, a Kmart special, you know, or something like that. Uh, but I mean, all countries have rivers, right? Uh, you know, that that kind of thing I'm talking about. So. Uh, and I, yeah, and I, I just love writing about the natural world, and and I think uh, I, I, I don't think I, I never think of myself as being a political writer. I hope I'm not in the sense of being a propagandist. But I think one thing that if you by writing about the natural world, I think there's something good that comes from that in the sense that we're not ignoring it, 
and we're we're uh, acknowledging our connection to it. I think sometimes we live today almost as if the natural, you know, we, we live in cyberspace or, you know, we, it's like we're, we're, we're cut off completely from the natural world, but, you know, we can believe that, but only at our peril. I mean, I'm not, I'm not preaching here. I mean, that's just a fact. I mean, if the world dies, we die with it. You know, we are part of it. And I think one thing that I, I think writing about the natural world does is remind us of that. Hope. Well, you're right. Uh, and, I mean, you know, it's easy sometimes to get depressed about the ecological situation, but if you could have seen the North Carolina Mountains about 1930, 1920s, and I, I mean, I, I've seen pictures of it. They, they were just raised. I mean, places you'll go today in the Smokies, and, and you, you, you know, a lot of people think, well, you know, this has never been cut. This has always been like this. No, you're exactly right. Second, third cuts. And, uh, and yeah, the, the one reason the land was, they were able to get the land pretty cheap was because the, the timber companies already cut it. So, I mean, it was worthless to them. And, uh, and uh, you know, and, 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 and I didn't mention this, but, the, you know, the, 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 the fight for that park is the backdrop of this novel. It's, that's that, you know, it's about that fight between the timber interest and the, uh, the people trying to build the park, Smoky Mountains National Park, and... Uh, if you know some of that story, it's a miracle that park exists. I mean, it was created during the Depression when there was so little money. And, and it was almost like every time it looked like it was going to fall apart, you know, some, something would happen. Uh, John D. Rockefeller actually contributed $5 million at a, just a crucial moment. A certain company, you know, sold, a timber company sold at a crucial moment. I mean, it just, everything had to kind of fall into place at the, at the right time. And... Uh, but it was also a very down and dirty fight. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that because the timber interests were actually bribing, blackmail. I mean, it was it got rough. Uh, the scale of it was very oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's it's an amazing story, and uh, and I bring some of it into the novel, but uh, it, it's much greater than that. Yeah, and there's some good books on it, uh, and. You know, the other thing I did, I actually inter I was fortunate enough to interview uh, several loggers who had logged in the Smokies. They're in the early 90s, and uh, and they gave me great, great, the great kind of stuff you never get in a book. I mean, they, just little details that I think somebody would have had to have worked that land to know, and uh, uh, that was that was a lot of fun doing that. Kind of, I love doing that kind of research where you're actually talking to people who do something like that. Uh, it took three years, and I worked harder on this book than any book I've ever written, and, and, and I really feel like I'll never work as hard on a book. This one, this one, people were worried about me. I mean, I had friends who told me that they could, when I finished this book, that they could see it in my face, that, you know, I'd been so wrapped up in it. But uh, three years, pretty much six hours a day, six days a week. Uh, first draft, I was writing 10, 12 hours a day for about first three or four months. So, you know, I'd take a couple of days off just to crash, sleep. But uh, worked real hard on it. What I'd do, I, you know, I kind of, uh, you know, uh, I started with that image, and, and I actually didn't really, I, I kind of do research. I don't do research beforehand. I kind of let the, the story lead me toward what I, I'm going to need to research. And uh, that's when, uh, you know, I, uh, I kind of follow follow where it goes, and then I did the research while I'm doing that. Uh, I did find one thing. One, I don't know if anybody in here is a writer. I suspect some of you are, but does anybody write historical fiction? Okay. Well, you may already know this, but I wanted to find out a lot of things about, you know, what, what would be the brand name of a, a pair of uh, suspenders or, you know, you know, those kinds of things or how much would a... Uh, uh, a pack of chewing gum, you know, th those little things that make a book real, a novel real, uh, or feel real. And uh, I finally realized, uh, I, I actually 
found it on eBay. I ordered a, a 1929 Sears Roebuck catalog. And, I mean, that, that thing was just wonderful for those kinds of things. And, you know, even the stuff I didn't use, it still kind of put me there. And uh, that's a great research tool, uh, you know, if you're doing a novel. Well, thank you. Yeah, you know, I think that's always a question. How do you end a novel and how do you, where do you start it? And, and I want to start a novel. What I want to do is immediately kind of draw the reader in. I mean, I think we all do with our openings. Uh, but it was, a, it was a paragraph I spent a good bit of time on, I'll tell you that, because I wanted it to get as much in there as I could and, uh, and draw the reader in and set up the conflict immediately. And, and, and kind of also just, you know, because I wanted this to be like a play, at least feel like a play in some ways. It was almost like I wanted all the characters on the stage immediately, and the major character literally on the boards, you know, the board, the platform, and uh, and and so that was also in my mind that I would have the major characters all right there at the beginning. Do uh. Well, you know, I knew pretty quickly, you know, I had that image and I, the story started coming to me and, I, and, and I, 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 I started realizing that it would begin with her actually, uh, with them coming to, to this, him bringing his bride, you know. And, and so I knew it was going to begin with them coming on the train. I didn't know if it was going to be, if I was going to have them on the train, but actually I started where they're step, essentially step, stepping off the train into this world. And also I used that because... At the end of the book, there there will be a, a resonance of that. So the, that image of the, someone stepping off the platform will come back. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Where did I get the idea? Well, I, I mean, I think it just, uh, you know, I always love to read, and, and uh, you know, I think one thing about growing up in the South is that you, you grow up knowing that, you know, uh, there's this great tradition of writing in the region. I think that was helpful. Uh, my family's been very supportive of me. Um, you know, I, I tend not to write uh, very autobiographically, and which probably helps, you know, I... I, I you know, I live the most boring life imaginable, so, you know, I, I don't write about myself very much. Uh, uh, I mean, never in, really in fiction, uh, occasionally in poems, a few poems, but uh, uh, they've been very supportive. My brother is actually my first reader, and, uh, you know, he's, he's good. Brothers don't have to be nice, you know, so he's very tough on me. Yeah. 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 Well, O'Connor, uh, when I, I think O'Connor's the best short story writer America's ever produced. Uh, I love her work. I love the ferocity of it, the honesty of it. Uh, there's an integrity to it. Uh, and she just knows how to write a story. I mean, when I teach, I teach short stories. I teach, uh, that's what I'm teaching this semester. And any time I teach short story, I start with a good man's hard to find because I tell him, you know, this is as perfect a short story as I know. And... Uh, yeah, certainly O'Connor, uh, a writer that's had a huge impact on me that I think comes out more and more uh, is, is Dostoevsky. Uh, that's a writer I've always been drawn to. I read him when I was 14, and it changed my life. Uh, made me want to be a writer. I think he was the first writer that, what, what his book, I read Crime and Punishment, and, you know, at 14, I, I know I missed a lot of what was going on, but... Uh, it, it put me in a, in a state, in a place that nothing had ever done before. And, and, and I thought, wow, you know, if, if a book can do this. And, and uh, you know, and I'm just kind of drawn to Dostoevsky. Uh, temperament, maybe, I'm not sure. Certainly, uh, you know, read, uh, I go back to, uh, I do love Elizabethan drama, uh, love Marlowe, as well as Shakespeare. <coughs> Uh, 
uh, go back to them a lot. Uh, and uh, uh, more contemporary uh, poets, Les Murray from Australia, Derek Walcott, uh, uh, Seamus Heaney, Northern Ireland. Uh, you know, those are all poets I admire. Uh, Annie Prue is a writer I greatly admire, contemporary writer, short story writer. I think she's one of the best right now in the United States. Uh, you know, yeah, just different, you know, I mean, just different people. I like Australian writer Tim Winton. I like uh, Kundera, you know, from Eastern Europe. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I try to read widely. I tell my students to do that. I don't want to read people who are doing the same thing I am. Uh, so, uh, you know, and I love to read nonfiction. Yeah. Yeah, that was very generous of him. He, he's he's a generous man. Yeah. Anything else? All right. Well, thank y'all for coming out.